restaurant choice is not that big deal. Hi, um, my name is Shari Wiseman. I'm the chief editor of Nature Neuroscience, and I'm here with Viviana Gradinaru um, from Caltech. Um, so Viviana, can you tell us a little bit about kind of the challenges that you hope to address with the tools that you're developing? Absolutely. I'm a neurotechnologist, and over the time, I've worked on methods to control neuronal activity, um, known as optogenetics, and also methods to provide anatomical maps of the circuits we are controlling with optogenetics. And some of those technologies are out there. Um, one form of it is clarity. And while using both optogenetics and clarity, I realized major bottlenecks in delivery of such tools. So for optogenetics, channel rhodopsins, halorhodopsins, and for clarity, the labels, mm -hmm. the fluorescent proteins that are needed to extract the morphology and connectivity information. And this research um, pointed me to the fact that there is a very limited um, array of tools that we have to access the non-transgenic brain. So that's what I've been focusing on for the past decade. So when you say the non-transgenic brain, why is it important for an animal to be transgenic or non-transgenic? Absolutely. So one way we scientists, we researchers can understand circuits underlying behavior is by having molecular access to those circuits. And we do this in animal models that where we have the ability for quick genetic modification. Mm -hmm. And maybe the most loved uh, system is the Drosophila, the fly, where you can have quick generation of these lines. And also in the rodents, now we have create drivers where a specific enzyme can be expressed in different cell types, and then by using intersectional approaches, you can decide which circuits to excite, which circuits to inhibit, or how you can upregulate or downregulate, for example, channels relevant in epilepsy. This all becomes much more difficult when you start thinking about animals with longer gestation time mm -hmm. and larger mammals. And once you get to humans, this is not a possibility to modify the germline or to modify the code. Mm. So can you talk a little bit more about what the tools are that you've been developing? Yes. Yeah, so one motivation has been to try to be able to deliver these tools brain-wide, the mammalian brain, in a way that you can cover all of the parts of the circuits that might be involved, for example, in something as complex as appetite or reward. It's not a simple node in one defined brain area. Mm -hmm. Many times it involves distributed networks throughout the brain with molecular complexity. So what I've been focusing on is how might we be able to cover the entire brain by accessing the vasculature, mm -hmm. because every single cell in our brain needs access to nutrients, and those nutrients are coming through the route of the bloodstream. And then between that blood flow and the neurons, there is a physical barrier, a cellular barrier, the blood-brain barrier. And this makes it difficult for all of the elements that are going through the bloodstream to access the neurons. Nutrients can make it through, immune defenses can make it through, but if we want to deliver genes or larger proteins or larger molecules, those do not have access to the brain. So that was a problem I focused on solving, starting with engineering uh, a vector, a delivery vector in the form of adeno-associated viral vector, mm -hmm. a benign protein shell where you can package the genetic material of interest. The problem has been that these vectors while working very well in neuroscience as a field has used these vectors for a long time through direct injections. Direct injections require highly invasive surgery, and that's not the only problem. The main one is that with direct injection, you lower a needle, you have your virus distributing only a limited volume around the injection spot. So maybe you can have a cover of coverage of one millimeter cube or so. And if you now scale up from the rodent brain to the larger primate brain or he even human brain to cover the circuit needed for certain behaviors, you, do, you need to do a lot of insertions, mm -hmm. lots of damage, and the coverage is not going to be uniform. So then the alternative is can we go through the bloodstream? Can we modify these vectors in a way that they would cross the blood-brain barrier and then provide this uniform brain-wide coverage? And that's what we did with directed evolution. 
I see. Can you talk more about what directed evolution is and kind of what um, results you were able to get? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful method to engineer better products. If you have a goal in mind, for example, a delivery vehicle across the blood-brain barrier, and if you have a starting point that crosses but not that strongly, and we found this in the form of the AAV9, the adeno-associated viral vector serotype 9, mm -hmm. that's now an approved, it's used as part of an approved gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. And this AV9 can cross well in young mammals, but as the body matures in adult mammals, the vector not only doesn't cross as well, but is mainly astrocytic, not necessarily neurons. So you don't get the cell types you want, you don't get the amount that you want. However, in directed evolution, you can take this parent and you can create diversity. You can create molecular diversity by changing the peptide signatures on the surface of the virus. You can provide insertions or substitutions. And then you can take this libraries of millions and millions of capsids, deliver them through a non-invasive simple bloodstream injection, and allow them to flow through the body. And then you can take the organs of interest, in our case the brain, and see who made it true. Mm -hmm. And by doing this process in a stringent way so we can raise above the biological noise, we are able over the years to make vectors that can cross the blood brain barrier in rodents, in different strains of rodents, and also in non-human primates, in marmosets, in macaque. And then we've also learned that some of these vectors can also enter different cell types with different preferences. Oh, very interesting. So what um, kinds of experiments <clears throat> excuse me, have been made possible because of these vectors that maybe couldn't have been possible before. So how, how have people been using these tools? One big challenge um, in the field has been to do genetic screens. And that's why the, the Drosophila research has been so impactful because mm. of the ability to do fast and powerful and informative genetic screens. However, in the mammalian world, because transgenesis is so slow, this has not been possible. And even with very powerful tools, uh, such as CRISPR-Cas, the genome editing tools, we did not quite have the ability to target many cell types throughout the brain with different instructions, with different codes to extract the information. So what's possible now is actually to make libraries of genetic modifiers and deliver them brain-wide and learn a great deal about pathways that are involved, for example, in disease or by doing this in preclinical models, or disease modifying pathways. So you can alter different, let's say, enzymes in the brain and see how does that affect the health status of a cell. Do you get neurodegeneration when you affect a certain pathway? If you downregulate enzyme, lysosomal enzymes, for example, yes, you might. And then once you do that, if you have an animal model of Alzheimer or Parkinson's, what pathways might you need to change and in what way to slow down the course of the disease. And the approach has been one, one at a time, and that obviously didn't get us too far. Mm -hmm. And what we can do now is to ask these questions uh, much faster and much better by doing these genetic screens brain-wide. Oh, that's amazing. Um, can you talk a little bit, you mentioned that AAV9 is used um, in an FDA-approved therapy, essentially a cure for mm -hmm. um, SMA. Can you talk a little bit more about the sort of clinical or preclinical implications of your work? Absolutely. So our work so far has been adopted by the basic research community and used in animal models of disease. And because of proof of concept of uh, disease rescue in, in rodents, of course, it points to the wonderful possibility one day to actually translate that. And then it becomes very important to ensure that such vectors or similar vectors can actually work in humans. And that's where it becomes very important to understand that the blood-brain barrier is not a monolith, it's not uniform within a single brain, but even our two blood-brain barriers m might have differences because mm -hmm. of our biological variables. And one needs to keep that in mind. So when we look at our vectors, we see vectors that perform in mice but don't perform in monkey, or we see vectors that perform well in monkey but they don't perform in the mouse. And this took my lab on the path of trying to understand the mechanism. 
because once you understand the mechanism of entry for these vectors, you can have much um, more predictive power in terms of which tool will you choose to ensure that it works in humans. So what we've learned through this process, so we've started basically asking the AAVs that we made and the community made, how do they get where they get so efficiently. We have vectors that cross the blood-brain barrier and enter neurons, vectors that go to the heart, vector that goes to the, let's say, the DR, dorsal root ganglia. We just ask them through molecular mm -hmm. uh, receptor screens, what's your match? What do you use to, to enter the, the target tissue or, or cell type? And we are starting to learn very important lessons. We first find new pathways to cross the blood-brain barrier. That's very important. And interestingly, we learn that some pathways might be conserved and some not. And this becomes very enabling information when you make choices around a clinical path. And that this science is very new mm -hmm. and ongoing. But I think there is great optimism ahead because we have AVs at work we can now understand their mechanism. Through their mechanism, we can know which one are likely to work or not in humans. And if we don't have the best solutions, once you have a receptor target, now we uh, develop methods in the lab where you can engineer against the receptor target. You can choose the best human receptor match for that particular clinical population and through in vitro screens with knowledge from structural biology, cryo EM, a microscopy and alpha fold modeling, you can incorporate all of this wonderful technological developments over the past decade and bring them together to engineer a vector that not only would work very well, but would work very well for the match, for the intended match in the clinic. So that's, it's becoming possible. Yeah. Work needs to be done, optimizations in tool development, there's always generation one and then <laughs> taking it through the needed steps. But it is, it's not a dream anymore. It's, there is a path and if we can act on it, there's a clear, I think, blueprint on how we might be able to enable gene therapies for severe neurological indications, ra ranging from pediatric epilepsy all the way to aging Alzheimer. Mm. And to do it in a much more kind of intentional, rational way as opposed to just sort of, you know, hoping that, that the drug or the, the gene therapy sort of gets where you, you want it to go. Absolutely. And that's very important for the adeno-associated viral vectors because the first dose will be recognized by the immune system and the body will create neutralizing antibodies that might prevent, let's say that wasn't a therapy match, now neutralizing antibodies might make redosaging or a second dose very difficult. Mm. So we, it has to be done carefully. So uh, what, um, what are kind of the next directions for your lab? What are the new things that you're excited to try? Yeah, uh, the AAVs are wonderful tools, and I'm excited to see them doing a lot of good in the research world and in the clinic as well. However, there are limitations around packaging capacity. They're mighty but small. Mm -hmm. And also because of, as I mentioned, neutralizing antibodies in some populations, they might not necessarily be eligible because of immune response um, for a therapy through AAV or that uses an AAV as a delivery vector. So what I'm excited about is with this mechanistic knowledge that we are accumulating from the engineered AAVs, so mechan mechanism agnostic engineered AAVs, they're telling us biological pathways that we have to enter organs and cell types. And this paves the way towards non-viral delivery by providing modifications to, for example, antibodies or oligonucleotides, you can decorate them with moieties that will ensure receptor binding. And then we have um, in our lab proof of concept that yes, receptors that are recognized by AVs to cross the blood-brain barrier can also be used to cross antibodies, for example. So I'm excited about expanding 
the possibility for delivery beyond non-viral delivery as well. Mm -hmm. While recognizing that AEVs are very strong and they will provide many solutions, they won't be able to solve everything. Yeah. I wonder, could the technology that you're developing or some of the insights that you're getting be used uh, for keeping viruses out of the brain? Oh, that's a, it's a wonderful question because sometimes we want to get to the brain. Mm -hmm. We want to get to the brain with therapies. But the reason we have the blood-brain barrier is that the brain needs to be protected from invading pathogens. Mm -hmm. And once we learn about all of these receptors, if anything, we start to wonder, imagine, it's good it didn't happen, but imagine if a pathogen like SARS-CoV-2 would evolve, because we've had so many strains, mm -hmm. would evolve to lock into one of these receptors. And there, there are viruses across the blood-brain barrier, HIV crosses. And there's also publications reporting that certain bacteria evolved to use the transferrin receptor to cross the blood-brain barrier. So that possibility is out there. Pathogens that get into our bloodstream either through what we smell or we ingest. And then if they have a match with the blood-brain barrier receptor, they might cross. However, what we're doing in this work now is very important because we are populating this list of receptors. So if in the unlucky event that suddenly we end up with a BBB permeant virus or bacteria, we, can, we have a lookup table and we can be prepared a bit in advance what would take to make blockers. Mm -hmm. And this is where chemical engineering, modeling, alpha fold structure predictions become very important because we can have these receptors and be prepared with blockers, just in case. And once you have a pathogen that finds a match and crosses into the brain, we can either get the blocker off the shelf or make one very quickly. And that's why it's important to understand this beyond neuroscience mm -hmm. and for pathogens. Oh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're out of time, but thank okay. you so much for joining me. It was really thank interesting. You. Mm -hmm.